Uh, this Advent season, we've been looking at putting a different spin on Christmas. We've actually put a spin on it from a Hebrews perspective, not a Jewish perspective, but from the book of Hebrews perspective. And as we've been doing that, we've been focusing uh, on Jesus Christ's birth. And uh, today, we're going to do that again. Uh, and you know the story. Uh, the story about how after Jesus was born. Uh, let me just, before I begin, say this. Everything in the Old Testament was pointing forward to the coming of our Lord. Somebody says the Bible is a book that bleeds. Anywhere you slice it or cut it, it bleeds Jesus. Every through through the Old Testament, it is pointing to Jesus. Now, when you get to uh, when you get into the New Testament and you get past the Gospels, it's all pointing back to Jesus. Because the, the book is completely about the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know the story. After Jesus was born, there was a custom, according to the law, every male child on the eighth day had to be circumcised. Jesus was born under the law, and he perfectly fulfilled the law. And so his parents took him on the eighth day that he might be circumcised. Now, there was also a purification period. If the mother had given a, a birth to a, a male, then after the circumcision, she had to wait 33 days in purification. And then she would go up, up, up to the temple and, and have a cleansing from her giving birth. It was all ceremonial. Now, if it had been a girl, it was 66 days. Now, you're going to ask me, why is that? I have no, no reason why. It's just that's the way God prescribed it. And so in our story here, we're going to find that they make a trip on the eighth day to get Jesus circumcised. And then 33 days later or 41 days later, they make another trip in order to have a consecration of the child. Because at that period of consecration of the child, it would be like our baby dedication. But they would take a lamb, and if they were too poor to afford a lamb, you could, take two turtle, you could take two pigeons or two doves and you could sacrifice them because every firstborn male child had to be redeemed under the law because of every firstborn male child belonged to the Lord. And so rather than dedicate them to the Lord, okay, you would actually sacrifice so that you were buying back your child from the Lord because he belonged to the Lord, okay, so that you could raise your child. And, and so this whole thing is going on in a context here, but you know the story. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise Jesus, he was named Jesus. That was the day you named the child. So kind of like I told you my story. I was Bruce for a little while. That's what my mom named me. And then she changed my name to Dennis. Well, Jesus was no name for eight days officially. They named him at the circumcision. And so he was named Jesus. Now notice what it says. The name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. Remember Gabriel, the angel, came to Mary and said, hey, you're going to be found with child. and You're going to give that child the name Jesus. She said, whoa, how can this be? How many of you like that video on uh, Christmas Eve where all of a sudden, how can this be? And that, boom, <laughs> there she was. What was it? That was so humorous. But how can this be? I said, you'll name him Jesus. Because his name Jesus means he will save his people from their sins. He's the Savior. So they named him just as they had said. Now we go to the next verse. When the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. This is like a child dedication going on here. We do this. We have child dedication. We had like three of them this year, right? We had baby dedication. And so they bring him up, and, and they got to make offering for him. And, and I skip over the verses how they make offering for him. And now there was a man in, J in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was a righteous and devout man. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, for most of us, we would say, boy, I sure hope he's a long time in coming, because <laughs> I'm not going to die until I see him. His, re his response was so different. I can't wait to see the Lord's Messiah. I can't wait to, to see the Lord's Messiah. 
In any case, <clears throat> I skip over a few more verses <clears throat> where he talks about uh, how he is going to be the redeemer of Israel. And then it says, then Simeon blessed them. Isn't that what we do at a, at a baby dedication? We bless the child. And he said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel. <laughs> John put it this way. He came unto his own and his own received him not. Those who did not receive him, they're the falling ones. But to as many as received him, that is that they believed in his name, to them he gave the authority to become the children of God. Those are the rising ones. He said, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against. You know who spoke against him? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the high priests, the priests, uh, the Roman officials. Everybody seemed to, it was the common, ordinary people who received him. This child will be destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel and will be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Even to this day, you can talk about God, and that's okay. But the moment you start talking about Jesus, that is a name that is offensive. That then begins to reveal where a person stands. It is a revealer. So that the thoughts of, the, of many hearts will be revealed. And then he turns to Mary and he says, and a sword will pierce your own soul. I think that's a reference to the fact that just 33 years later, outside the temple there in Jerusalem, outside Jerusalem, and on Mount Calvary, uh, Golgotha, she would watch her own son be crucified, her perfect child. Now, I know a lot of you think you have perfect children, and a lot of you know otherwise. She really had the perfect child. She would see her innocent son crucified, bearing the sins of the world. Her heart, her soul would be pierced. There was also a prophetess named Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. Would you say that with me? Very old. This is really important, very old. She was very old. She had lived with her husband for seven years. So she got married. Let's say she got married at 13. Young age, because old man, older guy, taking younger bride. Okay, just, just for argument's sake. Seven years they were married. So uh, since 20 years old, she has been a widow. She lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. That next line, until she was 84, is kind of ambiguous. The Net Bible, the New English Translation Bible, is my favorite Bible because uh, it has a sophisticated, a very accurate uh, uh, footnote system that tells you why the translators translated the passage the way they did. We'll tell you it's ambiguous. And they translated that she was then a widow for 84 years. So if you take that she was 20 when, uh, when she first became a widow, and, and then she was a widow for 84 years, how old does that make her? 104 years old. Now, that's what it says. Now, she was really old. <laughs> she never left the temple, but she worshipped night and day fasting and praying. Every now and then somebody will say, I'm so old, I feel like I'm totally useless. There's nothing for me to do. Why does God even keep me here? I just wish he would take me. I want to tell you, this verse tells me something really important. You are here, if for no other reason, you're on planet Earth so that you can do some praying and fasting and worshiping day and night. You are never without a purpose when you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. God always has something for you to do. It was the missionary David Livingston who said, I am immortal until God is finished with me. 
The day he is finished with me is the day he's calling me home, so I must have something to accomplish today. She's 104 years old, and she is serving God. Moses didn't even start until he was 80. Come on, we're, so most of us are we're, we're, we're in the peak of what we got to do for God. Because I'm going to say this. I think she probably accomplished more through her praying and worshiping and fasting day and night than a lot of the younger people of her day did with all of the vitality and strength and busyness of what they were doing. Now, she comes up to them at that very moment. The Spirit of God must have prompted her because she began giving thanks to God and she spoke about the child. So God the Holy Spirit was re responding to her worshiping day and night and praying and her fasting. And, and, and look, look what she says. She was giving thanks and she spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. They were looking for a redeemer. They were looking for a Messiah. This is it. You see, Jesus now is born, and now they're looking back, and they're looking on this life and saying, he's here, he's arrived. Now, Simeon can die because he's seen the consolation of Israel, and she says, here is our Redeemer, our Redeemer. Christmas involves a sacrifice. Because Joseph was poor, he brought the, the two doves, or he brought the birds rather than a lamb, and and he made a sacrifice because that fulfilled the law obligation for having a male firstborn son. I want to look back on Christmas too this morning. Christmas has happened. We celebrated it last uh, Tuesday. Um, Christmas happened. And uh, when Christ came into the world, it says in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. So I've jumped from chapter 2 all the way to chapter 10 of Hebrews. It said, when Christ came into the world. It's looking back. When Christ came into the world, it looks back and says, Jesus came bodily. This is so important. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. Now what he's talking about, the sacrifice and offerings. He's saying, you didn't want any more animals to be brought and slaughtered. They were, if you were to read the verses before this, they were all what, is, what the author of Hebrews calls a shadow. Now, the sun's shining through the window here, and, and you can see where, where it lights. It, it casts a shadow. And anything that's in the way, like the, bars on the, the crossbars on the window, are casting a shadow on the wall. He says, all the Old Testament was a shadow because the reality, and that's not the real window, that's just the shadow of the real window. And it's like, all the Old Testament, all the sacrifices, they were a shadow of the reality of Jesus Christ. It was all about Jesus. So he says, therefore, when Christ came into the world, he says, sacrifices and offerings you did not desire. It wasn't about bringing all these animal sacrifices but a body you prepared for me. This is a messianic quotation. It's about Jesus saying, it wasn't about all those animal sacrifices. Well, you just would have made another animal. But it was about the sacrifice I'm about to make. And even more important than that, the sacrifice, it is about one's will. One's will. Jesus came willingly. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Several times in the Old Testament, God has told them, I am so tired of your sacrifices and your offerings. Why? Because your heart is far from me. It would be like saying, hey, I went to church today. And what did you get out of it? Eh, not really anything. Well, what did you put into it? Well, I didn't put anything into it either. I just went through the motions and God is saying, I am so tired of you going through the motions. Your heart is far from me. You do not give me your will. You're living for yourself. He's saying, with burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Jesus Messiah is speaking here in this messianic part. Here I am. 
It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. Now that's what God wants. You put your offering in the offering plate. That's your offering. And you think, okay, I've done a good job of giving the Lord his offering. Do you really think the Lord needs your money? <laughs> he doesn't need your money. It was his to begin with. He gave it to you. What he wants is your heart. He wants your heart. He wants you to say, I love the Lord so much. He has blessed me with what I have that I am giving this because I love him. If you give it without the I love you, if you give it without the heart, the willingness, the, if you're just going through the routines, he's saying with your offerings, I'm not pleased. But if you attach to that your heart, you say, here I am, it's written all about about you, Lord, in the scroll. I'm, I've come to do your will. I'm here to do your will. Now with that, God is well pleased. Jesus came willingly to do whatever the Lord wanted him. Now he's been quoting from Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. And uh, as he's quoting from Psalm 40, he says, Sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them. That comes right from Psalm, Psalm 40. Then he says, although the law required them. You know why God's not pleased with offerings and sacrifices and all of that? Because they're reactive. They're reactive. You know why they had to make a sin offering? Because you sinned. You know why you had to make a trespass offering? Because you trespassed. He says, I would prefer that you just did my will and you didn't have to make an offering. Just give me your heart. Do what is right. Live for me. That way you don't have to do it. That's what he's saying here. The law required them because you messed up. Don't mess up. And you don't need to make an offering. A sacrifice. You don't have to kill it. A substitute. You know why Jesus died on the cross? Because I blew it. I messed up. I'm a sinner. And he took my sin. He was my sacrifice. He took my place. That's what this text can go on. The law required them as a fix. Not because he was well pleased with it. So then it says, he separates it. God was not pleased with the, the, those sacrifices because they're just fixing your sin. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. I have come to do your will. When he said that, the author of Hebrews adds, he set aside the first to establish the second. So to establish, he set aside the first. In the law, the Old Testament, I put here the tablets to represent the Old Testament, okay? And in that there was an old system of sacrifices. When you sinned, you took a sacrifice to the priest, he killed it, put your head on it before he killed it, transferred your guilt to it, he killed it, he sprinkled its blood and made, a, made an atonement, a covering for your sin for a short while. He said he set aside all that temporary business to establish a second. And that's what he's going to argue, that the will of God was for Jesus to die in our place so that we could once for all have salvation in Jesus Christ. He set aside the first in order to establish the second. You see, Jesus did come sacrificially because he did have to fix things. We were the sinners. We messed up. And Jesus was sent into the world. He says, and by the will of God and by that will, we have been made holy through his sacrifice. It was a willing sacrifice. Jesus voluntarily laid down on the cross. You know, when they came to get him, remember in the garden when they came to get him and take Jesus to be crucified? And they said, oh, whom, he said, whom seek you? And they, and they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And as soon as he said, I am he, all the soldiers fell back to the ground. They could not take and seize the Son of God. Remember, he, said, he could have called 10,000 angels to rescue him. 
But he's the one that prayed, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And so he's going to drink the bitter cup of our death. He's going to take our sins upon himself and die a death he should not have died because he was the innocent, sinless, perfect Lamb of God. He says, by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice. Jesus at one point says, no man takes my life, but I voluntarily lay it down for my sheep. It was a willing sacrifice. It was also a holy sacrifice. By him, we've been made holy. The word holy just means to set apart. He set us apart from everyone else who are just common people, but he made us special, objects of his love and his redemption. He set us apart, and this word is also translated in places as saints, holy ones. He made us saints, so you could call me Saint Dennis, (laughs) and if you know Jesus as your Savior, I can call you saint also, because he, by dying on the cross, made us holy, holy. My sin was put to his account. His holiness was put to my account. This is a transaction I just can't comprehend that he would die for me, pay the price that I might receive all the goods. Not only was it a holy sacrifice, it was a bodily sacrifice. This concept of bodily comes up often because some, some early church, uh, there was this thought that maybe he really wasn't a body in body, but just a phantom or a ghost or a spirit um, because uh, the body is so evil and sinful. And, and they associated evil and sinfulness with the flesh. But that is not true. Adam, when he was created with a body, was created sinless. Sin entered later. Sin is not my body. Jesus had a sinless body because he never sinned. That's why the virgin birth was so crucial. It kept him from the pollutions of our sin. He was the sinless son of God. And so bodily, though, he experiences everything we experience in the body except for sin, except for sin. Jesus Christ did this, it says, once for all. He was a substitute. He did this once for all. Now, he goes on to say, Jesus came sacrificially, but not as a reoccurring sacrifice. Every day, day after day, every priest would stand and perform his religious duties again and again. He offered the same sacrifices. Just go to Leviticus chapters 1 through 7. You'll just see all the different sacrifices. He said every day they did the same drill, the same routines, which can never take away sins. Why? They're just a shadow. They're just a shadow. They're not the reality. The reality is that Jesus Christ takes away sin. They're just a shadow. So John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus coming, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But when the priest had offered, this priest, this priest Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, it's just once. It is the final, complete sacrifice. That's why we do not celebrate a Mass. In a mass, they are re-crucifying Christ at every, every service. We don't do that. It's once for all, once for all. That's why in most Protestant churches, you don't find symbols of Jesus on the cross. You find an empty cross like we have above. No one's on it because he sacrificed once for all, for all, never to be sacrificed again. He died, he's risen. He's not on the cross. He's risen from the dead. This is our Jesus. This is our Savior. It is a final and complete transaction so that the Father sacrificed, accepted the sacrifice of the Son once for all. And so he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. We mentioned this earlier that the priest's work was never done. So if you were to go into the tabernacle or the temple, you would find that there are no chairs There are no chairs. They never got to sit down because their work was never finished. The people were never done sinning. And because the people were never done sinning, 
They always had another sacrifice to make. It was over and over. But Jesus' sacrifice, it covers it all because it takes away the sin of the world. It doesn't just cover it up and sweep it under the carpet. It literally takes it away, the sin of the world. It's final and complete. I notice here also that when he came, he came patiently, patiently. He sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. He's patient. The day is coming when Jesus Christ is going to return in the second advent of our Lord. He's going to come back, and he's going to come back, and he's going to conquer every foe, and he's going to set up a kingdom, and that kingdom is going to last for a thousand years, just as an introduction to the eternal state when he will rule forever and ever and ever, and all enemies will be his footrest. He is the victor. He is the victor. He came not only that way, he came perfectingly. Now I said perfectingly. Because by one sacrifice, he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Who's being made holy? I'm being made holy. Didn't I tell you? Call me St. Dennis. You know, I, I tease every now and then. I say to people, oh, I may not be perfect, but give me a week. And you know it's not even going to happen in a week. But I'll tell you, it is going to happen when Jesus returns. I will be glorified. The last phase of my salvation is I will be glorified and made perfect. And he's saying this sacrifice that he's made perfects forever those who are being made holy. Being made holy, those who are in the sanctification process, I am in God's eye seated in heavenly places, according to Ephesians chapter 1, I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He sees the rework of Jesus Christ so complete that he's already sees me seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and being perfect, even though I'm still here on earth. And my walk has not yet caught up with my position in Jesus Christ. But positionally, I am a saint of God. And if you know Jesus, you are too. You are too. You are too. I want you to think about this. Hebrews 10, 5 said, when Christ came into the world. <laughs> That's Christmas. I think this expression is even bigger than that. He's talking about the life of Christ. When Christ came into the world. John three seventeen put it this way. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. When Christ came into the world, but to save the world through him. Christ came into the world to save the world. That's what Christmas is about. Christ came into the world to save the world. Listen, this is what Christmas is about. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. That's what Paul said. Think about this. Christmas is about the fact that God became incarnate and came into the world to save you. That's why the angel said, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. He came into the world to save you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this theme is so emphatic in the Bible that it's got to be published and declared as the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he came into the world to save us. Lord, I pray that there's someone here that if they have not yet received Christ, that today would be the day where they say, thank you, Lord, for coming into the world to save me from my sins. I accept you, I receive you as my Savior, as my Lord, as my God. We know, Lord, that when anyone places their faith in Christ, it's at that moment that they become a Christian. They become a child of God. They become a saint. They become the Holy One. Their sins are forgiven, they are pardoned, and they are extended the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
They put them on like a garment. They're clothed in righteousness. And so you look down and you see your son, your daughter, in Jesus Christ. I pray that this is a birthday today for someone who places faith in Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.